Hello, friends, and welcome to summer at St. Andrew. It is my privilege to welcome you here today from the beautiful St. Andrew Sanctuary. I am grateful, as always, to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. If you have any questions about our church, prayer requests for our care team, or if you would like to get in touch with a member of our pastoral team or staff, please email info at gosaintandrew.com. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the St. Andrew community through our many classes, group life gatherings, service opportunities, and a host of summer events, you can visit our website or email us directly at connect at gosaintandrew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Just as a reminder, our full Sunday morning worship services, complete with music, prayer, announcements, liturgy, ministry spotlights, and the sermon, are live streamed on our YouTube page each week and permanently archived for viewing anytime. Lastly, to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can always visit gosaintandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now let's listen together to this week's scripture and sermon. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Lori and I were at a restaurant recently when I overheard this odd conversation between a father and his college-age son in the booth directly behind me. And I tried not to eavesdrop, but I couldn't help myself. This was one riveting conversation. The father said, how are things going? And the son said, good. The father said, how's the summer job? The son said, good. The father said, how are you feeling about going to see you this fall? The son said, good. The father said, how do you think their football team will do this year? The son said, good. This poor father, it was like pulling teeth. He said, how does your class schedule look for fall? And the son said, good. And the father said, you excited about living in the dorms? The son said, yeah. I mean, this kid was a real conversationalist, so engaging. The father said, did you decide on a major yet? And the son said, yeah. And the father said, what's your major? And the son said, communications. Sometimes listening to Jesus' teachings can feel a little like that conversation. There are times when Jesus could fill in a few more details for us, be uh, a little more forthcoming on the takeaways. He often teaches in this enigmatic, cryptographic, parabolic, open-ended style that leaves us scratching our heads like we sort of get it, but not really. And then we're left wondering, now what exactly is your point, Jesus? Like with these parables from Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like this, says Jesus. Like a mustard seed planted in the soil, like a sower scattering seed in a field, like a hidden treasure buried in a field, like weed and wheat uh, growing together in a field, like a dragnet cast into the sea, like a merchant searching for fine pearls. And we're thinking, yeah, okay, but which one exactly is it, Jesus? Is it one or the other or all of these? And uh, by the way, why do you say the kingdom of heaven is like these things? Can, can you just tell us what the kingdom of heaven actually is? But Jesus never tells us what the kingdom of heaven actually is. He just tells us what it's like. And maybe that's because the kingdom of heaven is impossible to pin down 
and fully described. It's like the Indian parable of the blind men encountering an elephant for the first time and trying to describe it based on the individual parts of the elephant. They happen to feel a tusk, an ear, a leg. And one says an elephant is hard, another leathery, another one rough like a tree. And none are wrong. They're just not entirely right. And so Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this. But for a lot of us, the kingdom of heaven is really hard to comprehend because we get hung up on these two operative words, kingdom and heaven. And we hear the word kingdom and we envision an actual physical place over which a king rules or governs. And then we hear the word heaven and we imagine an actual place that's up there or out there or at least definitely somewhere other than right here on earth. And so we assume the kingdom of heaven is a place we go to after we vacate this earthly kingdom. Somewhere where a, a white-bearded Colonel Sanders-looking patriarch sits on a throne like a know-it-all monarch, dispensing judgments and proclamation and giving orders to his minions. Only this is the very opposite of what Jesus had in mind when he spoke of the kingdom of heaven. For Jesus, this kingdom wasn't a specific place at all. And this heaven wasn't actually outside of time and space. And this kingdom of heaven wasn't governed by some omnipotent king like God who always gets his way and punishes those who get in his way. When William Tyndale translated the very first Bible into English in the year 1526, he translated this phrase, Basileo ton urna, as kingdom of heaven. Tyndale lived in this age when kings and kingdoms were everywhere, and where hierarchy and patriarchy dominated every facet of life, and Tyndale transposed his worldview to that of the Gospels. Now, 500 years later, we know that Tyndale's translation was a little like the blind man describing the elephant simply by using the only analogies he was familiar with. And today we don't live in a world where kings and kingdoms are the norm. And we certainly don't want to live in a world where hierarchy and patriarchy dominate every facet of our lives. The kingdom of heaven, it just misses the mark. Because what Jesus originally called the Basileo Tun Uranon is about as untranslatable as God's name itself. There was no equivalent for it in the Hebrew scripture. The ancient prophets, like the prophet Amos, came closest when they all spoke of the, quote, day of the Lord, which referred to that moment in time when God would set everything right and there would be shalom and abundance and dancing and no more suffering or hunger or injustice. And that's what Jesus had in mind when he spoke of what today we call the kingdom of heaven. It's not defined by a place or a palace or by power. It's a real lived experience. It's a present reality in this world in which shalom and peace and wholeness and abundance prevail for everyone. When Jesus taught about this reality in parables, he was saying that it's something like experiencing heaven on earth. He was saying that whenever the ineffable, indescribable, undefinable beauty, wonder, peace, and justice of God touch the ordinary, mundane, and imperfect realities of our world, we experience the kingdom of heaven. You can call it what you will, but Jesus described it as a heaven on earth experience. And isn't heaven on earth actually what we all long for? Not to be evacuated from the ordinary messiness of life here on earth, but to actually experience what it's like when the ordinary messiness of our lives is transformed by heaven coming to earth. 
Whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray those words, we're asking for God's highest aims, God's highest ideals for all creation to be experienced here, now, in this, in this realm of life. We're asking for the beauty and shalom of God to touch us and to live in us and to live through us. And so Jesus says, heaven on earth, it's, it's like the wheat and the weeds that somehow coexist in the field together. It's like the dragnet that's tossed into the sea and gathers up all kinds of fish. It's like a, it's like a hidden treasure buried in a field that someone by grace just stumbles upon. It's like the tiniest mustard seed that has the capacity, the tenacity to grow tall and strong. Heaven on earth, says Jesus, is something like that. It's like all these things. It's, wait, it's like yeast that a woman mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Yeah, that's what heaven on earth is like. When we do God's will in the here and now in this world, it's like living yeast, the, the life source that leavens and raises up everything around it. This is one of the shortest parables Jesus ever told, a simple one-liner, but every Jew understood its meaning because they were well acquainted with unleavened bread. Their ancestors ate it in the wilderness, and once a year, for seven straight days, every Jew had to eat it during the Feast of Unleavened Bread at Passover. Now, generally speaking, unleavened bread isn't super appetizing. It's dry and bland. It's not exactly heaven on earth. And that's the point. Jesus says, without yeast, bread is flat. It's bland, generally undesirable. And without heaven on earth, so too is life in this world. Have you ever had one of those moments, one of those days, one of those seasons when life just felt flat, bland, inert, humdrum? Have you ever looked at the world, at the state of things, at the sheer madness and brokenness and craziness of the world, and it all looked flat and bland? dry, undesirable. This parable reminds us that an unleavened life and an unleavened world is the very opposite of experiencing heaven on earth. So the parable calls us to look first inwardly and to take an inventory of our lives and to see if our souls are expanding and growing and rising and enlarging toward the best version of ourselves, or if they're actually contracting and shrinking and regressing towards some lesser version of ourselves. Is there living yeast within you to leaven your spirit? What kind of yeast dwells within you? If you've ever baked bread, you know that not just any yeast will do. There is living yeast and there is dead yeast. And yeast has a shelf life. So before mixing it with flour, every wise baker will test her yeast with a dash of sugar and some warm water. And if it bubbles, it's alive and active. So what about you? What's filling the space in your soul? Is it alive or dead? Is there anything bubbling up in you that Hints of an experience of heaven on earth. During my renewal leave, I, I took some time myself to search inwardly for those bubbles. Is my soul leavened, my spirit rising, or is it shrinking and flat and defeated? One of our great struggles as humans is that we try to live two lives or two selves. One is the self that we project in public. We all have this false self that tries to be what the world expects it to be. And so it prowls and hustles and haggles for affirmation. Maybe we think the world expects us to be successful or the smartest person in the room or good looking with a great tan and some six pack abs 
or perfect and holy and super righteous or the world's greatest mom or the number one dad or the high achieving Tracy Flick type student whom everyone just adores. You know, sometimes we actually succeed in being these things, at least on the outside. But eventually, inevitably, we discover that all that affirmation is just dead yeast. It doesn't actually enlarge or expand our hearts enough so that we can love and accept our true selves. And that's when life starts to feel more like hell on earth than heaven on earth because the world's affirmation is never enough. And so we grow irritable and miserable. Our spirits shrink because we listened to the wrong voices. That could have happened to Jesus. If you've ever wondered why Jesus tells all these parables in Matthew 13, just read Matthew 12. Because there he gets kicked around and attacked by the critics from the religious establishment. All those people who expect him to be someone he's not. Jesus plucks grain of wheat on the Sabbath, and so they say he's a heretic and a fraud. And Jesus heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, and they say he's such a bad rabbi. Jesus heals this demon-possessed man, and so they say Jesus must have come from the demon world himself. Oh, this criticism is awful. It's hurtful. It's so unfair. But Jesus knows that to be who they all want him to be would mean death to his true self, his soul, which is all about bringing heaven on earth. So he refuses to live out of this false self. And he leaves town in Matthew 12. He, he goes away by himself, and there he remembers that he's actually the very fulfillment of the words of the prophet Isaiah, who, in speaking of the coming Christ, says, Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. In the middle of all this criticism, here's this beautiful moment when Jesus remembers that he's God's beloved. That he's God's beloved and God's very soul is well pleased with him. In that moment, he reclaims his true self. He doesn't have to be anyone other than God's beloved. And that's heaven on earth. That's God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, in our very spirit. The voice of God's affirmation is the living yeast that leavens our soul and makes our spirit rise. And without it, we will never satisfy anyone. And we will never be living bread for the world because the dead yeast don't rise. What voices are you listening to? And do they make your spirit rise? Or do they diminish it? I love the story about the young artist who exhibits his artwork for the very first time. And a well-known art critic is in attendance. And the critic says to this young artist, would you like to hear my opinion of your work? And the artist says, yes, of course. And the critic says, it's worthless. And the artist says, I know, but let's hear it anyway. Refuse to mix dead yeast with your spirit. Remember your belovedness. Remember that God's very soul is well pleased with you. But there's something else in this parable about the yeast that speaks of what also makes for heaven on earth. It calls us not only to look inwardly at our spirits, but also to look outwardly at the spirit of our world. Do we see any bubbles in the collective spirit around us? Any evidence that the living yeast leavening in us is bubbling up and leavening the world? And the parable asks us, what are we doing to help make heaven on earth a reality in the world around us? In his book, Do I Stay Christian, Brian McLaren reminds us that one of the great hypocrisies of modern Christianity is the glaring lack of social transformation 
that it's generated in the U.S. He asked the question, what effect is the largest, most successful religion on this planet having on global well-being? I mean, look at the Earth's most serious problems, climate change, economic inequality, racism, war. How much time and energy has modern Christianity devoted to our most serious social problems? McLaren in his book notes that in the U.S., the states with the highest rates of church attendance are ironically ranked the lowest in life expectancy, happiness, median income, and education. Doesn't heaven on earth mean healthy lives, happy lives, educated lives? When Jesus taught about the kingdom of heaven, he wasn't giving us some evacuation plan to heaven, but a transformation plan for earth, a plan to help people become more loving humans who are committed to raising up more loving societies. So this parable reminds us that whenever we love our religion and our rules more than we love people, we become dead yeast and the very soul of our world shrinks. So we ask ourselves, are we living yeast or dead yeast in this world? Is there any evidence whatsoever that we were here? Are those around us, are they loved? And are they more loving because of us? It's about experiencing heaven on earth in the here and now. But the problem is it doesn't happen overnight. Yeast takes time to rise. Heaven on earth takes time to fully arrive. So there's work to do, and that's what the parable says. There's work to do on ourselves and work to do in the world, and it will take time. I read that in Turkey, in Turkey it's common to see homes that are unfinished. Wood piles and bricks are stacked next to unfinished homes with half a foundation and construction equipment scattered around sometimes for years. And the reason is that the Muslim culture doesn't allow for financial debt. People can only build homes with cash. And so they work for a while until they run out of money. Then they save up and they work a little more until they get the whole house built. Maybe that's how it works with creating heaven on earth. You can't build it if you don't have it. You can't leaven the world if you lack leaven in your own life. You can't build heaven on earth if your soul is in debt. And so you work and you save and you work a little more until heaven is finally here. Our takeaways for today, heaven on earth is like yeast that leavens the soul. Listen to the divine voice that makes your spirit rise. Leaven the world with living yeast.